Buonasera a tutti, welcome. Welcome back to the Breyer Center for Overseas Studies of Stanford University. Thank you for being here and understanding the heavy rain. We had a huge turnout in the RA school piece, but I think a few people might have been discouraged on their way over because it just started raining again. Well, um, it is a pleasure, a great pleasure for me to introduce this evening Jonathan Berger, our visiting faculty member from Stanford. Professor Berger is a Jenny family provost of mu professor of music and teaches composition, music theory, and cognition at the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics at Stanford. He was the founding co-director of the Stanford Institute for Creativity and the Arts, as well as founding director of Yale University's Center for Studies in Music Technology. A prolific composer, his pieces integrate science and the human experience and include operas, vocal, orchestral, and chamber music, orchestral and chamber music. Uh, the San Francisco Chronicle spoke of his most recent premiere, May Day, for the world-renowned Kronos String Quartet as, and I'm quoting, a fierce, hauntingly beautiful, and often harrowing work of musical theater, end quote. Swallow, his sixth string quartet, is currently being toured internationally by the St. Lawrence, Lawrence String Quartet. Upcoming commissions include a work for the Lincoln Center Chamber Music Society and for the 92nd Street Y in New York. Professor Berger was composer in residence at the Spoleto Festival in the USA and has commissions from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Andrew Mellon, the Ulit Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, Ulit Foundation, as well as a major research grant from the Wallenberg Foundation. I think my voice is too strong, let me move back just a, a little. Uh, 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 Berger's Chamber Opera, uh, Visitations, which the New York Times called Riveting, was performed in New York and California and has a new upcoming production, production in Chicago. He has also published over 70 scholarly journal articles and book chapters on music, per, on music perception and cognition, as well as an edited volume titled Music, Science, and the Rhythmic Brain. Professor Berger is currently teaching a class in Florence. The class is the Convergence of the Arts and Science in the Renaissance and Today. And it offers students a unique opportunity to combine historical, cultural, and aesthetic perspectives on the arts and sciences. The class makes full use of the city with frequent site visits to museums and architectural landmarks, and also the attendance at concerts and performances. Professor Berger and his wife, Talia, who also teaches music here at the program, as well as on campus at Sanford, are very much a presence at Palazzo Capone and an invaluable resource for the students and for all of us. Today, Professor Berger will speak on using sound to interpret the world around us. When I approached him uh, asking for a title, for a possible talk, he gave us four titles, each of which was very, very interesting in their work. One of us that we had to take a vote. So this uh, 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 title tonight is the result of a democratic vote among the staff and, and, and some of the students of the program. So I'm very, very pleased, uh, John, that you accepted our invitation to come speak tonight at our Encontre Palazzo Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Thank you, and, um, and this is a moment for me to thank um, not only Linda, but the incredibly wonderful staff here at, uh, at the Stanford Center. My colleagues, um, the teaching staff and the support staff are just absolutely wonderful. Students are great. It's really a wonderful, wonderful experience and um, sort of source of great pride for Stanford. Um, so um, my students here in, in Forenza are, uh, have been exploring the mapping of sound to space. Um, we're inspired by 
Guillaume du Fay's magnificent mot motet Nuper Rosorum Flores, which was written for the consecration of the Duomo in 1436. The work was composed to mirror in sound the architectural proportions of the space. This mapping, which reflects Brunelleschi's architectural proportions in the temporal structure of the music, has also inspired me to think about how sound can convey information and conversely how data inspired my music. I'm just going to play the first 30 seconds of the motet. Human physiology is designed to interpret the world around us through sound. Our eyes are fixed in front of our heads and are graced with lids that can turn sensory input off. Our ears, on the other hand, are brilliantly rigged to localize sound peripherally. We have no ear lids. We cannot shut out sound. We've evolved to identify patterns of speech and environmental sounds amidst the constant din of sonic input. We're adept at analyzing incoming sound, able, for example, to be startled at the crunch of fallen leaves 100 meters behind us and instantly determine whether the footstep is that of a mountain lion, a doe, a friend, or a foe. Not only has evolution provided a robust auditory analysis engine for identifying the source of footsteps in fallen leaves, it has provided a system that identifies threat and opportunity by unconsciously computing relative size and speed of approaching footsteps. We are, for example, uncannily adept at unconsciously identifying gender from foot human footsteps. My students and I at Stanford have done extensive research on this topic. Our auditory interpretive abilities are remarkable. We select sweet fruit by slapping a melon rind, implicitly analyzing the ratio of sugar to water hidden within. Do they do that in Florence? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We find the right, okay, this is not a good analogy for, uh, for the walls here in Florence, but in the United States, this works quite well. We find the right location to hang a paint, painting by listening to the resonance of empty space between dry walls and outer walls until we hear the thud that re represents the thud, the stud. Remarkably, with the vast advance of technology since Linnaeus invented a method of listening to the heart and lungs in his patients, the stethoscope remains a standard adornment for physicians. Linnaeus was, by the way, a skilled musician as well as a physician. He was well aware of the power of sound to interpret problems lying beneath the epidermis. By learning a compact set of patterns of medical auscultations, medical students learn to identify a variety of complex conditions, ranging from arrhythmia to fluid in the lungs. They don't typically stop to realize that the sonic language they learn integrates tempo, rhythm, pitch, loudness, and timbre. That's my daughter. <laughs> In a very real sense, the stethoscope is a tool that allows physicians to interpret short musical scores and then diagnose accordingly. Sound informs, informs us when, when to shift gears when we're driving and alerts us to, uh, to automotive problems. These sounds are critical for identifying mechanical failure. In fact, Automobile mechanics who, like doctors, stud finders, watermelon choosers, invisibly diagnose what's under a closed hood, have a common language for sound. I call this language the language of pings, rattles, and knocks. The characteristics of these three musical instruments create a clear auditory image. It's a music stripped of the emotional baggage, except for her perhaps having to pay the bill for a fix. Um, but it's, a, but it's a, a, a language nonetheless that arranges sound in ways that we can actually diagnose what's happening. Any parent 
whose child has played a string instrument will instantly identify with the agony of the sounds of a beginner scraping horsehair against catgut. It is a painful and terrifying sound. But with persistence and a good deal of patience, there occurs a magical moment in which that sound is suddenly clear in pitch and perhaps even beautiful. That's my other daughter. Um, that's her a, bit, a few years later. The physiology involved with producing a replicable, beautiful sound is complex and mysterious. Yet the auditory feedback of the trial and error process teaches these young nestles how to conspire to create music. In my lab, this by the way is work that I did with Jessica Gramati, who was here, here at Florence last year. Um, in my lab, we tried to simulate the auditory feedback paradigm in learning a motor skill that typically lacks sonic response. The golf swing is a grown-up analogy to the mystifyingly complex motor action of bowing the cello, but without the associated sound. Inspired by my beginning daughter cellist, we used a computer model of a singing voice and mapped aspects of the golfer's swing to the physical model. Like the cellist, when the player hears a beautiful tone, the swing is a good one. La, 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 la. You can tell which, which of the swings were successful golf swings, the ones that sounded most like a, a human singing. And so we've de we're developing a method of auditory feedback where someone can learn to swing a golf club with, with, the, with the sound response, similarly to listening, to learning how to bow a cello. I've been developing other means of expressing complex multi-dimensional data using sound, and in particular musical sound. What you see before you is a representation of a highly dimensional spectral analysis of colon cells. Each pixel comprises many dimensions. Thus, the compression to a two-dimensional tricolor image is not terribly revealing. However, mapping the array of, of, of each pixel to sound parameters reveals the underlying chemistry and allows us to detect the difference between a healthy cell and a malignant cell. So while, while you're listening to this, what I'm, what, what's happening here is we're, we're traversing this image, and as the, as the mouse traverses each pixel, it's reading not the color of the pixel, but all of the data that's stored beneath that pixel, which there are about 200 different numbers. And it's, in, it's mapping those numbers to auditory filters that's then creating the sound. And over time, we learn to identify the difference between the chemical constituencies of particular sounds and others. In this mapping, where the sounds are less musical, where they're less pitched, they're, they're, um, they're malignant. Where they're more pitched, they're healthy. Here's the same sound of cellular chemistry used as a musical element in, in a work of music. And so what I did here was a, a slightly different mapping. So we're constantly experimenting with how to map sound in different ways. Um, and rather than simply going pixel by pixel across the board, we've done an expressive loop that creates some sort of expressive tempo mapping. Three years ago, a colleague of mine in the School of Medicine invited me to collaborate on an idea to regulate breathing during imaging. The imaging method being used, which is called 4D CT scanning, was highly sensitive to minute irregularities. However, the images were sus highly susceptible to noise distor distortion, and that noise distortion happened when the patient breathed, breathed. When the patient breathed irregularly, which is what most patients do when they're nervous and in the scanner, um, the, the output data was too noisy to really interpret well. So we explored the notion of using auditory feedback to calm the patient and came up with an embarrassingly simple 
but very effective paradigm, a paradigm that's now has been in clinical trials for the last, the last two years around the world. What we do is we track the patient's breathing as she's being prepared for the scan. So she's sitting in the, in the, in outside of the scanner prep and has a, uh, a, a uh, 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 sensor simply stuck to her, the, the lungs, over the lungs. And a camera is tra tracking the motion as she breathes in and out. We, um, we track the patient's breathing as she's being prepped for the scan, and we take an average of the, that, that tracking, which takes about 10 minutes, and we call that normative breathing. So we average that, and that becomes her breathing rate. Then, as we set the, as, as the, sorry, as we set that accompaniment to a song with chords changing at the tempo of her normative breathing. So if you can imagine, as she's breathing up and down, and this is her normal breathing, these becomes the strums of any popular song. We can actually choose any song we want. Um, so she, her breathing, her normal breathing, is playing is playing the guitar. We then set the accompaniment to the to the chords that are changing at the tempo of her normal breathing. Then we end, as she enters the scanner, she continue. We continue to monitor her breathing, and we, but we this time we're mapping her breathing to the melody that goes with that song. Because her breathing becomes highly erratic, because she's nervous, the song goes completely out of whack with the, with the, with the chord changes. We thought we would have to give instructions as to how to hear that, but it turned out that most of our subjects didn't need instructions at all. They immediately recognized that if they were to breathe more normally and calm down, that, they would, that the music would start sounding good together. So this is a, um, um, a sort of a wonderful self-teaching mechanism that therapeutically prepares patients to breathe normally under those conditions. Over the past 15 years, I've used data in many of my musical compositions from a commission, for a commission to compose a sound inst installation for Dale Chihuly's monumental Millennium Exhibition in the Light of Jerusalem that was um, went up in 2000 and was up for about 18 months. I embedded light and temperature sensors in the colored glass chunks of the central sculpture in Chihuly's exhibition, a, a sculpture he called the, the Crystal Mountain. The constant stream of data that cre created a virtual sundial and a weather station. So it constantly knew how much light was coming in and constantly knew the, the temperature. So it was computing something about the meteorological and atmospheric and temporal conditions of, of the moment. The data was used as variables in a set of filters and resonators that affected recordings of calls to prayers of various religions in the city, such that the cycles of time of prayer and of seasons created an ever-changing set of variations on these sounds. Here's a sn snippet of an early song. <laughs> Coast, 27 kilometers south of Beirut, 10 kilometers north of Sidon. The town is built on the ancient city Perfirium, where a giant fish was purported to have delivered Jonah to the shore. On July, on July 14, 2006, the day of the military conflict, the third day of the military conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, a rocket hit a fuel storage area in an aging power station in Gia causing over 20,000 tons of oil to spill into the Mediterranean Sea. 
The potential ecological disaster unfolding without attention had an urgency and poignancy of its own. However, in the context of the rapidly escalating conflict, the event became a metaphor of the absurdity and tragedy of this and of all wars. Satellite imagery gathered by NASA's ASTER, the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emissions and Reflect Reflection Radiometer, flying aboard Terra, a satellite launched in 1999 as part of the National Aeronautic and Space Administration's Earth Observing System, documented the spread of the oil over, over days. The images struck me as strangely beautiful, as they were frightening. The contours of the oil spill seemed to dance with the coastline, as if attempting to break free of its partner. Despite the composition, the pattern seemed ornate, flowing, remarkably graceful. These image beca images became objects of considerable com contemplation and of great meaning, both for the information they provided and for the poetic symbolism of the tragedy of war. Throughout much of 2008, I worked on ways to create a musical statement about the senselessness of war using these images, resulting in two works, one an electroacoustic work and another a concerto for violin, string orchestra, cymbalon, and percussion. In both, careful measurements and mapping of the satellite Im images were used in the creation of music. I'm going to play the slow movement of the, the violin concerto, which takes about five minutes.
That was, uh, by the way, Livia Sohn, an absolutely stunning, wonderful violinist. Um, so I first took the data and sonified it. Sonified is a term we use for taking information and mapping it to sound. We sonified it, I sonified the satellite photographs, mapping the computed dispersion of the spill in relation to the shore um, to filter settings, much as I did with the, with the, uh, with the uh, cancer cells. Um, so the greater the diffusion in the sea, the greater was the diffusion in sound. I'll play a few examples. Here you have um, a, a series of photographs. You have the first day, I think it was the, the fourth day, the, again the first day, and it's hard to see the, the dispersion, but here it goes farther out. So that's the first day. Oops, sorry. Can I get first day. Further out. Then that first day. So you get a sense of the spread of the oil by how the how the um, the, the sound is being dispersed. So um, so this is the beginning of a piece that I did for eight channel sound. That means the audience sits sits in the middle of of a sound field. They're basically sitting in the Mediterranean Sea, and they're here. They're being enveloped by the by the oil over time, and the mapping of the oil over time. It's compressed in time, but it's a, it's actually a very accurate mapping from what was interpreted from the satellite data. Um, So in the first movement of the, of the violin concerto, again, there are two pieces. There's a, the electronic piece that is an accurate mapping over, um, I don't remember, about eight to 10 minutes of what happened over the course of, of eight to 10 days. Um, in, the, in the violin concerto, I used mapping in two different ways. So in the first movement, the dispersion was mapped by the density of the string orchestra. So in separate sections, each photograph was then mapped to how the string orchestra um, um, it changed its level of density. So you'll hear it in the example I'll play, you'll hear it, um, a string of orchestra come together and then sort of spread out in, in the pitch world. So again, that spread is pretty accurate, accurately reflected how the how the body spreads up. Here's the opening of the third movement in which I used a very different type of mapping. I was going to play the first few, few seconds of the opening and now I'll talk about the mapping. So, um, so here's how I did the mapping in this movement. In this movement, what 
what seem to be Baroque-like patterns at the edges of the oil spill really interested me as ornamentation, sort of the way Baroque, Baroque writers ornamented around a, a, uh, a given tone. So I took those patterns and I created a pitch map that was very similar to ornamenting, um, ornamenting the violin line. So um, what you hear on the surface of the sea is mapped to the violin line, which effectively sequentially traces the shape of each photograph. <laughs> So I'm going to close with um, with about an eight minute. Do we have eight minutes? We're yes. okay. So I'm going to close with an eight minute example and then wrap up by coming back out of my musical world and coming back to my students' musical world. So um, I'm going to close with some experts from my recent chamber opera, Visitations. Visitations is an opera that explores hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, and it's two conjoined works. Um, the first, Theotokia, portrays the hallucinatory world of an individual suffering from schizophrenia. The second, The War Reporter, is a true story of a war reporter haunted by the voice of a dead soldier whose corpse he photographed. He, he actually won the, uh, the uh, Pulitzer Prize for a photograph that he did in Mogadishu. Anyone who's seen the, the film Black Hawk Down, this was that occurrence. And, um, and he became intensely involved in the writing of this, of this opera. So, so I was writing an opera about someone who I actually became friendly with over time, um, which was a strange phenomenon in itself. Um, so using a method of precise sound spatialization called ambisonics, um, and data that I got from a neuroscientist from London who was studying brain imaging of verbal hallucinations, I was able to virtually place the audience inside the skull of the protagonists in both operas, so that, um, so that as hallucinations happened, the, the electronics that were happening in the hall were actually producing sounds that came from exact, the exact localizations. It was localizing sound exactly where, where in the brain the hallucinations start. So, um, so with the onset of hallucination, the resulting narrative were, pro, were then portrayed on stage. So the audience would basically know that a hallucination is happening and then see the hallucination acted out. So I'm gonna play a segment from the final scene of Theotopia. Here the protagonist, Leon, profoundly schizophrenic, lives in a world of deeply ritualized religious delusion under the spell of an imagined mother of God who lives in a cave in the Himalayas. The audience witnesses Leon's hallucinations, yet we don't hear Leon's voice until the very end of the opera, when in a moment of painful reality, he suddenly understands that his world around him is delusional. I'm gonna play the last seven or eight minutes. <laughs>
So that's, that's the hallucination.
So, to close, we, we return to Florence. And I'm going to leave you with sounds collected by my students in my class who have been studying, among other things, Leonardo's fascination with the flow and dynamics of water. The Arno is a constantly changing symphony whose depth and current are portrayed by the music of the river. The students have, I think, started very skeptically and have actually come in to be very moved by these sounds. And they're bringing sounds and said, listen to the differences. I can hear the differences. So, um, so I'm very pleased because they're beginning to listen to data and listen to sound and understand, um, understand really how da Vinci was so inspired by all the sounds around him. One of the things that, um, that many things that I've gotten out of Florence is rereading Da Vinci in the context of being here, um, seeing little sentences that he says. For example, he has a passing sentence that says, when you listen to the bells in Florence, one can hear whatever they want. And then when you listen to the bells, you realize that they're so complex that you can pull any information out of them. There's no right or wrong. And that was so inspiring and so important to me. So, um, so I'm, I'm actually reliving all of my musical experience and understanding data and interpretation through this. And so as a final reminder, a reminder of, of Guillaume de Fay, who realized the potential of musical proportions to describe the architectural stru structure of that magnificent cathedral right across the river. I think you just the first 30 seconds of Nucleus on the over the last 15 or 20 years. So about, um, about 15 years ago, a colleague of mine then at Yale, Craig Wright, refuted this argument that, that Dufay wrote the music in, in um, strict relationship to the architectural proportions of, of the church, something that I don't, I don't entirely buy. But one of the arguments that came out of this as, as, as this sort of debate raged was what were the real sources of architectural proportions? And it seems to come back to a Renaissance concept of the tabernacle. And so, um, so that, that the proportions in the tabernacle, which were of course also um, golden ratio proportions, um, were then, it really also all boils down to the golden ratio. And, um, and where, whether you find the source of it compelling or not, all of these are all of these expressions are really looking at those mathematical proportions, those geometric proportions. It's not a 
not an entirely fair answer. But. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering if you could describe the sonification process that you mentioned. Is there a fixed mapping between the color spectrum and the acoustic spectrum, or is that something that you tweak the so uh, mapping? So th that's, that's a really wonderful question. One of the, one of the problems of sonification, there, there's a whole community working on what we call auditory display. In fact, there's an international conference every year of people like me who get together and compare notes and try to develop things. One of the big problems of the field is that there's no lingua franca. There's no, there's no common assumptions about what the best way for mapping is. And so we're constantly playing with mapping. We're constantly exploring them. Um, you know, I have the great advantage of being a composer, not a scientist. And I live through the, sci I live through the sciences with my colleagues. And so, um, so I can take artistic license wherever I want. And, um, and that ends up being a very sort of a, a, a healthy relationship. So the answer is um, each, each experiment, these are experiments, and each experiment tries different types of mappings. Um, I've never actually mapped, well I have, but I've never really um, successfully mapped to pitch to color, which is a very easy thing to do. And you know, there's a whole world of people out there who, are, who, um, who have sort of an, a, a hardwired mapping synesthetic mapping of, of pitch to color. One of the problems of synesthesia, well, problem, one of the features of synesthesia is that no two people who have that synesthetic mapping see this, hear the same colors that they see. So even there, the mapping is, is, um, is very, um, it's, it's elusive to get any handle on. So, um, so what I did here with, with the ones that you saw, the visuals, it wasn't the colors that I was mapping, it was the, the, the data that, that those pixels that each color was, being re was representing, which was a much larger set of numbers. And there I wasn't mapping them to pitches, I was mapping them to filters. So an easy way to think about this is, on your stereo set, there's often a graphic equalizer with, where you can equalize many different bands. Well, if you could think about a graphic equalizer that's broken into almost an infinite number of possibilities, um, that's how I'm doing the mapping. So I can get many, many different types of, of filter settings, and that then shapes the sound. Yes, if, if you leave aside the artistic piece of it, and you think about the scientific piece, um, what's, what areas do, do the scientists think that there's real value in doing this. Now, just think about those two examples, one of the, the sonification of the cellular chemistry, and the second on the, the teaching the golfing through auditory, auditory feedback. Is it seen as, as potentially something that's, that, that will add to sort of the, either the ability to learn or to the diagnosis, or is it just an interesting thing to do? Well, I think it's gone beyond interesting. Um, and uh, there are a number of different applied areas. One is, one is um, facilitating vision-impaired scientists to explore data. And actually, that's a robust area. So there's a lot of, a lot of work being done on, on how to explore data without, without the visual cues. We're so visually oriented. The other, the other aspect that, that scientists find appealing is that when you have a lot of data, I mean, even think about, think about tracking the stock market over time, right? So if you're tracking many different stocks and you're doing, and you're, you're doing volume and price and, and indices, um, you put them, you overlay them, and you'll get a nice visual picture, but it'll be so noisy that you really can't get anything out of it. And so using sound as an assistive technology here, or sometimes as a replacement, tends to be, um, tends to be very useful. So, um, so in terms of applying to science, it's, 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 it's emerging. And I'm not a crusader of it. I think it, it has to happen naturally. Where it is turning out to be an extremely useful area is in educating the public. So for example, um, in atmospheric science, people who are, who are climatologists, who have this, this urgency to explain the, um, the dramatic changes of climate, 
They have tons of data and tons of numbers, but very few people are taking those numbers seriously. In fact, the Republican Party in the country I live in is just poo-pooing it as if it's nothing. But it turns out that you can actually make dramatic soundscapes that show the difference, that show how these things are changing over time. And, and as a teaching tool, and as a dissemination tool, I think it's very useful. Thank you. Thank you all.